Good afternoon, everybody. As I said, I hope you enjoyed your meal and everything. Um, I'm, the, uh, I'm a keynote speaker here, so I thought I take the liberty of um, telling you something that is very closely related to the topics that I saw in the program and I also heard um, in the morning when I was here, but you probably think there's not as much of a relationship, but you will see there is a lot of relationship. Many of you, depending on your personal views of life, uh, may probably also think that it is uh, not so much of relevance, but um, since I hope you all have a scientific background, I hope you understand what I'm talking about. So um, normally I'm a forensic biologist. I'm the only one in Germany who is officially sworn in and certified for all types of biological stains, DNA, insects, sperm, saliva, blood, hair, etc., which is unusual in Germany. And our symbol from the beginning was um, those of you at home, you cannot see it, but the ones here in the room can see my laser pointer, is that we just use the facts. So each eye that you see in the skull, because we are mostly dealing with rape and homicides and uh, things, abductions and all types of crime and violent crime, so therefore we have a skull, each um, eye that you see here is a window to whatever happened. Let's call it the truth for now. So the more windows we have, the more data we have, the more do, the more information do we have about the case. We do absolutely not care if somebody is good, bad, tall, small, you know, has a higher weight or a lower weight. I absolutely don't care. The only thing that I care about is the data. And um, what we usually do, just to give you an example when it comes to insects, it can be something that, is, that happened a very long time ago. For example, here, these are the mummies at, at the Capucin monks in Palermo in southern Italy. Uh, you see the stereotypical picture of death that you see in comic books. Th this is derived from, from those Capucin monks um, because uh, today in every comic book and every movie, the death ha has a caput, cap that's why they're called Capucin monks. Catholic, um, it's a Catholic priest. And um, they are standing there and as you probably see when you just look at the facts, you s allegedly these are mummies, as I just mentioned, but when you look closer, or if, if you would look closer, you would see this is not a mummy, this is a skeleton. And that's exactly what we do. So no matter what, what people present us and no matter how often somebody claims they know what it is, we don't care. We only look at the data and the facts. So in this case, we say, okay, if there's no tissue, then it's not a mummy because a mummy is defined by dried tissue. If I just see the bone, it cannot be a mummy, it's a skeleton. So um, we get closer and we try to find out what happened. Has it ever been a mummy or was it never a mummy? Or what happened here? Is, is this just a fake? Are people just presenting dressed up uh, skeletons as mummies to make money or out of religious regions or for whatever reason? So we look, get a closer look and most of you who are sitting here, or at least the ones who are dealing with insects, know that many insects uh, pupate in a hard shell like this. And then we take out the insect pupa and, uh, for example, can look for the ecological properties. This is also something that many of you do uh, when you work, at least the ones of you who work with insects. You look for the properties, for example, what do they like? You just heard the talk before my talk was about microclimatic and micro... <laughs> all micro influences <laughs> that you can, can have on growth and on the survival or on the death of the animals. We also know very often which temperature they like. That's also something that you're concerned with, which humidity, which day, length of day, and etc. And we use that to find out what happened. It could be a criminal case that happened one week ago. It could be a criminal case that happened one hour ago. It could be something that happened 1,000 years ago. I don't care. The little stickers, you, you will hear, uh, don't worry, the, I will start to care very soon in this speech. Um, the little stickers that you see here are so-called crime scene stickers. They contain a millimeter, centimeter, and a color code. And uh, please uh, feel free to take as many as you want from my wife. She's sitting down there and she's providing you with those stickers because you, you can hand them out to people who do not work scientifically and tell them, okay, whatever you take a picture of, whatever you talk about, make a measurement. Do not talk to me without a data basis. If you don't have data, we can have a beer and we can discuss that. But we can also talk about the actual data and information that is measured. So this is a symbol for that at the same time. You can imagine that it's a little bit difficult to describe the color of the pupae here. Are they brown, are they red or, or reddish or red brown or what? So it's better to have a color scale in here. Now, um, what I thought when I, when I traveled uh, to this conference was 
maybe one thing that you that you are all intertwined and concerned with, for example, Niels, he was just telling me that he's trying to give people better um, yeah, access to more energy, more calories, or higher quality of food in developing countries, etc. But at the same time, we are in the deepest crisis that we ever had concerning of climate and insects. So this is the tour that I will take you through and it's going to be a very rough one for many of you. And when you, at the end of the speech, I would guess that 90% of you will say, okay, Bineki, you know, he's, he's just like an environment freak. Let, let, him, let him go. But we'll, I'll talk about the data. Problem number one. If we want to live in a world where we change our food habits, then of course people would have to know about the environment. However, as everybody knows, most people don't even know why wasps exist. You can ask, in your, you can ask your family, why do you think wasps exist? And then people would say, well, to steal plum cake or to drink my lemonade, you know, they would just make some fun remark. But do you know why wasps exist? I mean, could you explain to your kids why wasps exist? What biological function do wasps have? And I guarantee you, you probably don't know. Many of you don't know. And um, that, is a, that is a problem. I will tell you in a second. But I just want to show you a little picture that we produced for the International Congress of Dipterology. And I asked the dipterologists, do you know why all types of flies exist? I mean, which biological function do they have in the food web that you are probably concerned with? Or in the exchange of calories? Or in the, in the improvement of health? Or whatever your personal or laboratory topic is. And most people did not know. At, I mean, they knew about their particular group. The thing is that insects, this is from an online speech, but this is already published, Brock et al. from this year. I, I tried to show you data mostly from 2021. Most of the wasps, or many of the wasps, not most of them, are pollinators. Did you know that? Most people think of honeybees as pollinators, but flies and wasps, um, their main function in the food web is not only the recycling of material, as we know from plum cake, etc., but they pollinate everything. So what do you do when we, when we don't get our climate crisis, if we don't get a grip on that? We are losing all the species. You've heard about that. You will hear more about that. And then we don't have pollination anymore. What do you do on a planet without pollinators? Nothing. We all will die as, as the species that's on top of the you know, health pyramid or, or whatever pyramid you want to use. So um, many of these insects, of course, change, the, change their habitats. And that's also a thing that's of concern. You try to bring the insects, uh, those of you who work with insects, under laboratory conditions and try to breed them and work with them. But that doesn't help you if you have a lot of insects as a food source when the rest of the biological food web is just dying down and going down the drain. Because you cannot just uh, eat one type of insect or uh, the problem that we have now that more than two thirds of all the acres that, that uh, plants are farmed on and animals are living on are farmed for five animal species, for five vertebrate species. And being, if you're a biologist like me, you know that, that that is not even a sick joke and not even a sad joke, that is just nothing. That cannot be, that is completely impossible. So breeding and um, insects for food purposes, etc., is intertwined and interrelated with the rest of the food web as any type of food production or calorie production is. Also, the wasps have many other uh, functions. For example, I, I don't want to go into that, but uh, for example, regulating services inside of the web of life, let's call it like, like that, you know, all, all algae, plants, animals, even air and water. So um, the colleague, Brock et al., the colleagues, they um, just made a little picture to show you how deeply all these um, wasp species here are interrelated with, um, let's call it, other types of life and all the functions that you saw. And those of you who are not biologists, who come more from an industrial background or for an economics background or for, you know, for companies that deal with the matter, you probably don't realize what, uh, what happens when you just have um, one or two or in our case five vertebrate species or like honeybees that most people consider to be important, they are not. Honeybees are not of importance at all for nothing. They are just for fun and games for humans, but that's it. If honeybees would die out, nobody would care because pollination and all the other uh, uh, services that you uh, just saw as a little glimpse are not provided by honeybees. These are just animals like, you know, the, those five vertebrate species that you see, they are of no relevance. Um, in former times, that was like 25 years ago, 
we had a lot, the web of life was much more intact than it is now in September 2021, as I speak here, or as we all speak. When you went to a um, ventilation shaft and just took out the dirt, then the dirt was not what you see today. Today you see textile fibers and, uh, you know, uh, from traf traffic uh, related dirt. But formerly, and those of you who are a little bit older, like me, <laughs> probably remember that this was all insect material. Our nature is completely composed of insects, or let's call it of six and eight legged animals to include spiders and mites, etc. Um, people today do not know that. They have no idea that obviously we have a lot of bacteria and uh, single cellular um, organisms, but we, let's, let's forget that for a second. But if we talk on a multicellular level, we live on the planet of arthropods, six and, you know, eight legged and six legged. So um, this web of life is already destroyed. Now, um, this is a little picture that looks uh, maybe childish, like you could uh, show it in a kindergarten or somewhere, but you will be very surprised to see where it comes from. What you see here is that from 1960 to 2020 or 2021, because like I said, I would like to show you very recent data, if possible from this month, um, you see that there was a lot of biodiversity and most of us, or at least the people who's, who are sitting here, are older than, let's say, many of them are older than 35 or 40 years old. You, we remember those times, but what we, don't, what we did not fully realize is that everything died out. Um, this curve is actually not from a kindergarten, but this is from uh, the IPCC report that was very recently published a few months ago. From the, um, and they ask people, scientists, to um, yeah, make some illustrations that better show people how important um, the web of biodiversity, mostly insects, like I said, is. And what you see here is now, this, this is actual data, real data from an observatory, Mauna Loa Observatory. You see the CO2 concentration is rising, you see the years, and bam, biodiversity goes afloat and is gone. So this is from a, this is called hashtag uh, say it with science. Um, you can see it here that I'm not making it up. This is a tweet from two days ago. Uh, from IPCC. For those of you who are not uh, scientists, IPCC is the one, number one um, yeah, <laughs> organization dealing with climate change and their most recent report just came out and nobody is giving swear words anything about it. Nobody cares. Um, if you read the report, you, you, I guarantee you, you cannot sleep uh, for the next night anymore. So this is the actual report. If you're interested, it came out in July 2021. And once again, this is an actual illustration of actual data. It is not a kindergarten picture that you draw for a birthday party in a kindergarten. For those of you, again, who are not scientists, these reports are assembled, or the last report from July 2021 was assembled out of 6,000 studies and had 1,000 reviewers. This is, this is an unbelievable amount of competence, uh, unchallenged by nothing. Um, these are the, uh, the yearly temperatures in Germany, and you probably all know that, but probably you don't look at the data, especially you don't look at the most recent data, because like me, you are probably a little bit older. And you know, you lost track, let's say, in the 80s, because you said, well, okay, I know that the environment is in a bad state. So what you can see here is, an, in, a, in an actual a measured um, data set that you, that you can per, uh, perfectly check by yourself, so you don't have to believe me, so this is the source here. You can see that uh, the temperature was rising a little bit and uh, some people are saying, well, that's a natural event. Well, it's a little bit uh, strange that the natural event all of a sudden starts to grow in such a rapid manner. Of course, we had the warmest summers and the warmest years in the past years. You probably uh, realize that. Those of you who uh, lived in uh, Sachsen-Anhalt, where we are now in the county, or in Brandenburg County, probably also remember the year 2003, I guess, where, where we had the first time such a heat wave and people just couldn't believe it. And now why I'm telling you this on an insect conference, because that was the first time I saw insects die on a massive scale. I work with insects on corpses, blowflies, the blue shiny ones, the green shiny ones, and many others. And for the first time in my life, that, that was in Brandenburg County in Germany, it was so hot that only the wasps survived. So the wasps took over whatever they could took, take from the corpses, meat in that case, but that obviously was such a disruption in the web of life that we were all like, what the hell is going on? And it took uh, until now, 15 years later approximately, to understand what was going on. So what is the data set when you're talking about that? This is uh, without a page number because um, this is, this is uh, the, a screenshot 
from the paper before it was published, but this is also from this year. Um, do we really know that insects are affected by climate change? And when it comes to your uh, line of work, will it really affect your work? Yes, it will. Um, so what, the, what every study finds, no matter what insects they look at, uh, is that when you disrupt the web of life, mostly due to climate change and everything that's related to it, flooding, heat, everything else, I will go into more detail into that in a second, causes, for example, an early emergence from diapause. I think most of you know what that means. That means that the insects, for example, if they have a resting state or if they have a pupation state, that's not diapause. So they live in different stages of life, and these stages are disrupted. Usually, that would not be a problem, especially not in the laboratory, and you would say, well, okay, then I just you know, take control of the light and humidity and everything. But again, your laboratory or your facility or whatever you want to try to produce or to bring people in developing countries is obviously related to everything that's outside. Because if, you're, if you're, the whole uh, laboratory is flooded or burning down, or if you bring it to a, uh, to a population that is very poor and economically unstable, then of course, uh, if, the, if the insects that, for example, they're using as food cannot be produced, as you would call it anymore, then uh, they don't have anything to eat anymore. And why, why is that a problem? Because due to the ch shifts in the life cycle, you have an increasing asynchronicity, I would call it, or asynchrony with host plants. So let's say you bring insects to, pop to, to people who just cannot build an uh, industrialized uh, planting farm or, or a factory or whatever you want to call it uh, to produce insects or other types. It, it could also be plants because you're also dealing with plant oils, etc. So you need to at least have a minimum in, yeah, uh, the, the web of life has to, has to be minimally intact. And that is not the case anymore. So you can have a laboratory condition, but like I said, only if everything else works, because sooner or later everything will break down. And here in this case, how, how do you deal with the food for the animals that, for example, you're going to produce wherever to feed people? Well, you harvest the plants outside of your laboratory, obviously. Okay, that doesn't work anymore. Now what? Okay, I built a facility for plants. And you see where this leads to. It leads to nothing, because in the end, you will have monoculture for your, let's say, black soldier flies. Then you have a monoculture for the plants that they are feeding from, or even from the plants that somebody else is giving you for free, like, your, you know, like we talked about the supermarket or uh, any, you know, it, it could be just regular waste. And that's just not in synchronicity anymore. But also, don't forget that many of the natural animals, and that relates to the wasps and the plants, need pollination and all the other structure services. Because if you just breed one or two types of plants and one or two types of animals, then again, your web of life is just breaking down and nothing works anymore. The same problem, and that is something that you're very likely going to smile about, is light pollution. Light pollution, as you, everybody of you knows that, you, you put out a candle or something at, at a dinner outside in the garden, maybe tonight when you're having the dinner outside, and then probably moths and, and all types of other animals are flying around, some are flying into the flame, and then some kids come and say, Daddy or Mama, you know, I, I don't like it that the moth, you know, burns down in the candle flame, and you're like, yeah, come on, you know, there are worse problems on planet Earth. Well, what do you think, what happens due to, the, due to all the light pollution that we have? This is an actual map, you can look it up. This, I looked it up today to give you the most recent data. This is the light pollution map from today. And what happens is, concerning to insects, oops, same thing again, early emergence from diapause and increasing asynchrony with host plants. So what I would like to show you is that even if you smile about a problem and think it's of no relevance, then maybe, I, I won't manage to do it today in, in this speech, but maybe in two or three years you will think about this lecture and like, wait a second, I heard about that. All these little disruptions, or major disruptions sometimes, lead to the problem that our natural environment becomes so unstable that at the end, the production that we would like to provide, out of economical reasons, out of social reasons, cultural reasons, personal reasons, whatever your motivation is, cannot work anymore because the rest of the world is just burning down or drowning. So that is something that probably you should consider next time when your kid comes and tells you that it doesn't like the little moth flying into the a flame of your candle. This is an actual problem on a very large scale. And uh, what you maybe saw in the past uh, days is that the, uh, all those floodings at the same, they occurred at the same time. Many people thought that uh, dryness 
or a droughts are the problem, but flooding is of obviously the same problem. If everything floods, then no plant can uh, live there anymore, and the same is true for the insects that you are trying to produce, and the same is true, and you should never forget that, for the power lines for your laboratory. If your power lines and your computers get flooded, then they don't work anymore, and all your infrastructure is going to burn down. Just in case you're not so interested in the United States a perspective of all of this, because we're here in Europe, um, the next mayor of New York City, the most likely next mayor, literally, I mean, word by word said he has never witnessed anything like that in Manhattan um, and uh, the whole area of New York. And just for those of you who probably didn't follow the news, I just would like to show you that and imagine that is your laboratory. This is at uh, 28th Street in Manhattan, so in the middle of town, and all of a sudden you have a flooding like this. This happened a few days ago, a few days ago. Okay, and then you're like, ah, come on, that's just a singular event, you know, somebody is going to pump the water out. Let's have a look at a little bit longer of a news report. This is a two-minute news report. Um, probably you cannot hear the sounds, but maybe the, the sound guys can switch on the sound. Because it's quite interesting what people uh, are saying. But even if, if they don't, you, you see the problem. Same pictures as, uh, as over. No, don't worry, it's only two minutes. Don't worry, you don't have to. Hmm? Yes. No, don't worry, it's not a problem. People, people are, uh, are going to see the problem. I just, I just want to point you to one thing. Um, because obviously, uh, since this is from a news report, there's a scientist standing um, in between and saying, well, you know, we know that for a very long time. And much, some of you probably don't know how I am. That's the airport. Well, I would like to see you transporting your material, whatever you're, you're producing, uh, under such conditions. The trains do not work anymore, the cars do not work anymore, the airplanes do not work anymore. How, how, how economically speaking do you want to deal with that? Money is not going to help you, because take your money, throw it at the airport or the train, throw it anywhere, and then what? Nothing happens. This problem cannot be solved by money or by the, by the standard economical decisions that you are used to make. You have to rethink what you're doing and, as, and also your business, because no matter if you provide it on a slow scale, uh, on a small scale, like I said, or on the big scale, it's not working if you cannot transport or reach or market your product. This is something, like, like the lady said in the end, it's not only about sustainability. That's probably for some of you just a greenwashing thing and you just do it for the customers or you personally believe in actual sustainability. But let's say you're a dry 
um, um, nature unfriendly banking person, even then you have the same problem because the bread and butter on your table, you know, it's just not going to be delivered. This is also from the, this month. Nobody is listening, seriously. The world scientists warning of a climate emergency is now, um, it took place in many cities in which the city councils decide that the city is on emergency. Many German cities also decided on that. Probably you heard about that and you were smiling like, ah, oh, it's nice, the Friday kids, you know, they got what they wanted. We have a climate emergency now in, you know, whatever, let's say Berlin or Cologne or Hannover, or Magdeburg, whatever, but um, nothing happens. So the cities declare a climate emergency because somebody understands the problem, but absolutely nothing happens. Uh, that is bad because as you will see, or as you probably get an idea, the problems are not going to be solvable by money. Let's take this paper, just this paper that came out this month. Again, these are all peer-reviewed scientific papers, nothing else. I'm not going to show you anything else, apart from the tabloid with the wasps. <laughs> with the wasps. Um, there are a lot of data, you're probably bored, you know all that, you know, like carbon dioxide is going up, you're like, yawn, I know that, methane is going up, etc. Okay, let's look at one thing that, you are, that directly, directly affects your work. What do you do when the area that you could plant plants on, or feed insects on, or plant something out of which you produce oil or calories, let's call it calories, because that's what we are, at the end of the day, what we are talking about, then you just can't work anymore. And then you're like, ah, come on, I have my plantation, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to buy something else if, if this is flooding or drying out. Well, I'm not so sure, because the only known solution scientifically by all scientists who are dealing with the matter in peer-reviewed scientific journals based on all measurements from the past 50 years come to one single solution, and that is degrowth is the only solution. Now, those of you who, you, who are in a company or, you know, working in a, in a classical environment in which, of course, you would like to try to produce money, you, you would like to make money out of, out of your company or out of whatever you have, um, how do you degrow? That's probably something that you are, that nobody taught you that, nobody. You, you, are, you are like a child wandering in the dark or, or you know, in the mist. You, you don't know how to degrow and to sustainability and everything. That's just something for you that the Friday's kids are, are carrying around. Um, why should you not fly anymore? I mean, wh what does one uh, airplane fly, uh, you know? So what, I, mean, I can do it, nobody's going to challenge me. Well, again, the thing that I'm trying to hammer into you here, or to massage into you, to massage into you, not hammer, <laughs> is that it's a web of life. And I know that because, like I said, I work with insects on corpses. There are so many insects on corpses. I, I even personally found a new species unknown to science before that. I mean, I didn't realize that it was unknown before. That was done by my taxonomic colleague. But I collected it from a, from a pig somewhere in Peru or Colombia in Latin America. And this web of life, is currently challenged in, a, in, a, in such a dramatic way that what you see now when you go to the buffet and just eat mostly unsustainable food, mostly not plant-based food, you're just like, ah, I don't know, it, it can't be that bad. Well, you are directly con contributing to the problem by, by eating, uh, by using um, animal matter there. Insects are just a step into the direction of uh, plant food here. You don't believe me? Okay, I'll show you an example. Because I know the resistance is getting up and you're like, ah, oh, when is Bineki stopping? I don't want to hear that. He's just a you know, fanatic nature hippie. Okay, let's, let's, let's take out a pig, a dead pig, and we put a malaise trap on top. Those of you who deal with um, entomology more intimately, you know that it's a trap where the insects fly in and then they are killed inside. So you know all of the insects that in this case are interested in dead pigs. Uh, are collected. One of my students did that, Markus Halbach. Gladly, we found a few people who could determine all the insects. Many of them are as small as a, as a poppy seed. And out of that poppy seed, you have to pull out the genital organs. You know, that's a very difficult task <laughs> so, to determine them. So they did that. It was a, it was a master's thesis, or diploma white at that point. And you, probably you cannot even read what is here, but every color and every name is a, is a species. When I presented this for the first time, only to people who were working with insects on corpses, so it was highly specialized. There were maybe 30 people in the room. It was the conference of forensic entomologists, insects on corpses uh, scientists. Um, everybody in the room was like, wow, I've never seen that. I never knew that. 
I mean, not, not even remotely. I had no swear word idea that, that we had so many. What, what are the animals doing there? Most of these animals were not even known to use insect, uh, to use um, decomposing animal matter as orientation site, or as you saw with the wasps, providing services. You're probably still asking yourself which services, but yeah, if you want to, you can um, look that up. Now, you, now uh, we are on the insect conference that's also dealing with economic affairs and social affairs and you know, economic help, etc. Now, the problem is much older than the Club of Rome report that came out 50 years ago, uh, which already foretold that Earth is warming up and we will, the ice is going to melt and everything. This is known for five, zero years already, for 50 years, just for the younger ones. Don't believe your parents and grandparents telling you, oh, wait, that came out September 2021. I'm super sorry. You know, they know, they know it since 50 years. And even Charles Darwin knew it. And now this is something that um, directly involves you because I would like to call the whole question of plant oils, insects as food, etc. as in, in my view, let's call it acro uh, or, or yeah, um, dealing with, in the very far sense, with farming matters. Let's call it farming matters to just make up a term. Charles Darwin, he was a very economically thinking man, not ecologically, economically. So how much money can we make out of things? Because he's a British person, and the British obviously were very much, uh, a or still are, a nation that is a very economic, uh, have, they have a very economic stand, uh, viewpoint on things. Charles Darwin wrote this book, The Humus and the Earthworm, and he said, without earthworms, we just cannot survive. The same, like I told you before, with flies and wasps, because they provide all types of services. Now look at this. This is from 2015, so relatively old, so to speak. And you can see that the more the land use intensity increases, and we are now in, the se in September 2021 at a land use increase that is hard to increase anymore, apart from just burning down more forests in, in uh, Southern America and so on. Um, the forests in Southern America this year became CO2 emitters. The forests in Southern America are producing CO2 by now as we speak. They are not collecting CO2 anymore. They are producing CO2 due to, due to their destruction. So the more land use you have, and we have the most intensive land use ever seen since humans exist on the planet, the more the size of the earthworm shrinks. Now, this is really funny. Again, your kid comes home with an earthworm and you're like, yeah, very nice, put it out in the garden or whatever. Yeah? Nobody cares about that, but economically speaking, how would any of you deal with money, um, economical measures, human labor, manpower, woman power? How do you want to deal with the, all the work that is provided by earthworms on planet Earth? Impossible, not possible, by no means not possible. So we know by measurement that the size of the earthworms is shrinking. Now at the same time, just to show you, because probably you are going to say, ah, yeah, these are short-term effects, we can reverse everything, we are scientists, you know, standing in the laboratory. If you look, for example, at the grain yield, the grain yield is getting up, obviously, Th that's what you are also interested in, more insects, more plants, more for economical reasons, I understand that. The, um, the more problematic, is this brown line that you probably didn't look at very much. And you see again that from 1840, which is now really quite a while ago, I think we can agree in, even in scientific terms, we are not talk talking about geological um, matters here, but about biological matters. And until 2020 or 21, the, um, the rainworm or <laughs> the earthworm line is just going down. And the reason for that is that the plants are treated with substances that you probably know, and those substances lead to better plant yields, but at the same time, the, the earthworms are disappearing. Now, again, you're going to say, I'm bored of this, I don't want to hear about earthworms and moth and Fridays for Future Kids, you know, it's really not our problem. Yes, it is, because like I showed, did show you before, you cannot entertain your business anymore under conditions under which nobody has food anymore, because you cannot produce as many insects that, that people are going just going to eat insects because remember they need to be fed by something and this something is not available anymore then. Um, this is um, another problem which I just remotely want to touch and uh, just a quick one. That's 
now you could say, okay, let's reduce CO2, let's do it quickly because the next conference is coming up, the next climate conference, the international one, and let's just switch to um, energy that is renewable, renewable energies. Now what you see here is that when you use uh, wind um, engines, then depending on the height of the tower and also the, the length of the rotor blades, they will kill more and more and more bats and birds. So even if we switch to completely, let's call it non-coal-based and non-nuclear energies, we again have disruptions in the ecological nets. Some of the bats um, manage to fly around areas where, the, where, where those huge renewable power plants, wind plants are, but some don't. The data in this field is usually not funded by governments, so there's very sparse data available. I just was at a conference where one of the scientists who's dealing with the matter would just say, we just have those data, we have no funding for further um, research on the matter. But let's come back to the economical thing that's interesting for you, because you all live for money. You, you cannot entertain, like I said, your business if you don't have that. Did you read this report? This is a report that came out this year. It's the report from the British Treasury, das Britische Finanzministerium, the, the Ministry for Money in England. They, they brought out a report if, how to deal with the matter on an economic scale, economic, not ecological scale. And they said, we need a rapid, complete change in uh, the way we do economics. This is the UN report, not the IPCC report that I just mentioned before, also from this year. And the United Nations decided to name it so people understand it, making peace with nature. This is a scientific blueprint for a better biodiversity and climate in the next years. Did you read that? No, because you probably think it's not related to my business, not to production of insects, etc. But it is, like I told you before. So um, since you're probably not interested in that, I'll just read you one line. There's an urgent need. That's an official United Nations statement. There's an urgent need for a clear break with current trends of environmental decline and the coming decade is crucial. And as we know, it's not the coming decade. Oh, somebody's taking a picture. I will put the speech uh, to YouTube if you want to. You can also this, so you can see it on YouTube uh, in a few days. And um, as you probably heard, the latest news that came out a few weeks ago is that we do not have a decade anymore. That was the state at the beginning of 2021, that we have a decade to re reduce our, our CO2 budget. But that's not the state of science anymore. We know now that we are in the worst case scenario. We are not in the 1.5 uh, degrees Celsius um, raise in temperature on planet Earth anymore. We are not talking about that anymore. That is gone. Forget it. We cannot reach that anymore. It is scientifically impossible. We are now dealing with the worst case scenario since a few weeks. We know that we are in the 3 degrees Celsius um, raise of temperature environment now. So uh, don't believe anybody who's presenting you data that is a little bit old or who's just making political statements or you know, personal private statements. It is not the truth. Now back to economics. Um, this is um, also an interesting graph that shows you, again, I will put it on YouTube and the, the source is here, um, how much money can we make out of nature? Because probably you would say, you know what, I'm, I'm 55, I make money 20 years, you know, and then after 20 years I'm 75 and then I fly to a remote island and then, you know, I'm happy and I don't care about the rest of the world. My life was good and I don't give a rat's, you know, crap about the rest of the world. Not going to happen because also economically everything is going down the drain because the produced capital, the amount of money that we, have, where that we produce, measured, this is not it's something that is just calculated, the produced capital is going up. You know that there are a lot of millionaires and billionaires on planet Earth more and more. But the problem is that the human capital invested into humans is not going up. So because of that, and because of we are using nature all the time, this is all, this is, that, this is interesting for us because we depend on nature, of course. This is also declining. And this is an old graph, and you know where the graph is going, obviously, down the hill. And you know where we are now in 2021. So even if you come out of an economic situation, you should be not only concerned, but you should change, as you read from United Nations, the way you deal with economics and your lifestyle. You cannot use animal products anymore. You cannot do that. This contributes to everything that you saw before. It's not only about CO2 reduction that must be dealt with by political persons, but you have to do something in your company. Um, what does it mean when we're talking about worst case scenario? I'll show you, and, and maybe you know it, maybe not. I'll just show you that the source is here again. It's from PINS. Um, 
until a few years ago, we thought that we could put planet Earth to avoid that it is heating up and not getting into the worst case scenario in which we are now, as I speak here, into a stabilized state um, yeah, uh, environment. So Earth, is, this is time here and Earth is rolling down and maybe if we do a little bit of a stewardship system, you know, reduce CO2, don't use animal material anymore, etc. We are going to, we are coming to stabilized Earth. Well, um, you already know what I'm going to say. This did not happen. This is, this is also very recent. I think maybe, I don't know, I don't remember, maybe two to three or something years ago. And um, it did not work like this. Earth is rolling down here and we are getting into hothouse Earth. This will challenge everything that you do economically, personally, business style, on every single level. You remember the picture from the news that you just saw. And the, and the scientist who just said, okay, this was supposed to be the 100 year flood, but it's coming, you know, the extreme weather is coming all the time. Okay, now you're saying, oh, I'm so tired of it. Bineki, really stop it, really. I, it's just, I don't know, I just feel that this is going to go well, yeah? I, I, we can continue the way that we learned to deal with our business. We, we don't want you, the, the, the sock-wearing biologist, to, to tell us about economics and about our business and science and so on. Okay, this is from a map again. This is um, the source. You can uh, look it up yourself. It's uh, usually called uh, rising seas or rising tides, but it's from Climate Central. It contains all the data that are known about the um, r rise of the sea level. And this is the, I, you, you can play with it as much as you want. It has a huge menu. You can feed in whatever you want. Not, but not the data. The data obviously come from all sources around the world. What you see here is a um, sea raising level in the year 2050, 2052, so not very, very far in the future. And you probably see, wait a second, do I see correctly that Bremen, Hamburg, Amsterdam, Rotterdam, etc., will be below sea level? And they would say, well, I don't know, I mean, many cities are below sea level, so let's just build up some dikes, also Deiche. No, let's build up some dikes. Well, how many dikes can you economically build? If you don't know that, for example, you don't live at the sea, you probably have no idea how expensive dikes are. Did you know that in the Netherlands, the first line behind the dikes is already completely evacuated? If you have a house there, then you don't have the house anymore. The Reichswaterschaft is, an, is, a, is a governmental body which has ex executive power, like the police in Germany, and they already evacuated the first line behind the dikes. This already happened. So I am not the one telling you the bad things that are going to happen in the future and then probably all goes well. It already happened. We are in the worst case scenario. The flooding already happens everywhere. So we are not in the movie situations that you, you know, just you, you, you open your shackles, free yourself and then everything becomes good. We are five past 12 or one past 12, or whatever you, wanna, whatever you wanna call it. So once again, I want to see the German government and us as the taxpayers building dikes to protect Bremen and Hamburg from the flooding once it is under, the, under sea level. Technically, no problem, but financially, a big problem. Do you remember? Probably not, because you're all too young. But, the, but the, the truly older ones here in the building, and the younger ones can Google it, Google flooding of Hamburg, and then, then you will get an idea of what, what the economic impact uh, is going to be. This, you cannot solve this with any amount of money. Um, I'm not going to go into deeply into the water problem because that's uh, probably something that you're not dealing so much. I just want to show you where do we get our data from. It all started, and that is very insect related now. Again, some of you probably know, some not. The whole thing that really, really made politicians and also scientists interested was this paper. It came out a few years ago. In, uh, it's from Krefeld in Germany. And it's a study that found that 75% uh, in a natural reserve, in a Naturschutzgebiet of insects, um, were gone um, within an, like 25 years, 27 years, now more like 30 something years. And everybody said, even the statistics people said, that cannot be. It is not possible. That is the thought that you have from the very moment since I'm speaking here. You're like, no, that I did not hear that. Why, why, do I know, why do I not know about that? Well, you don't know about it because you don't read the new scientific publications that I showed you. And um, it started with this paper. The guys in Krefeld went to uh, set up a huge malaise trap, many actually, 
Again, these are the traps where the insects fly in and then they're trapped and killed, but this time not with dead animals. So these are all insects now. Not insects that are interested in decomposing uh, pigs, but all insects. And next to it, you see, probably you can see that agricultural field. And um, so these were huge malaise traps. The insects are flying, oh, for, for the international viewers or for those of you who don't come from Germany, where's Krefeld? So again, you see uh, the light pollution thing that I already mentioned here, and let's get closer. Krefeld is somewhere here, probably that won't tell you much, but uh, maybe a city that you've heard of is Düsseldorf here. That's, that's, it's, it's in the west, this is Brussels over here, and um, Rotterdam. So when we get closer, you see that this is a relatively normal little city, Krefeld, industrialized, uh, very ugly also, but I'm, I, I still like it a lot. It's, it's, it's not like Magdeburg where everything gets polished now and, and beautified. And um, they went and looked from um, 1989 at that point, at the point of publication until 2016, over, over 17,000 um, days of, collect of, of measurements. So this is a very, very huge number of measurements. And if you make just a quick calculation, you would come to a roughly 50 years of measurements. But um, this is just to show you that this is not, as many people say, based on, a, on a, a bad data set. And what came out, and that is now again interesting for you, is that most of the influences that led to the killing of the insects uh, are unknown. It's not, it's not just the drying out of, um, of here, like uh, accessibility to water, uh, grassland sites, how much forest you have, nitrogen, that would be something that you would probably think of, but, but uh, herbs, um, frost days, temp uh, temperature, but the most of it is unknown. And that really rang a bell, even with the scientists who, are who were usually not interested with that. For example, insect collectors and taxonomists and you know, these insect people that you never see with the checkerboard pattern shirts and the, and the spectacles at the Museum of Natural History. And they were like, Ugh, I don't know, we don't. And um, now they became interested because if there is such a big unknown measured with data by scientists, then you're like, okay, that is not good. Imagine that would happen in your laboratory. All your insects die in your laboratory, and, you're like, and, and then you make an analysis, and you're like, uh, we don't know what, we just don't know. Yeah? No, you don't want that. So something bigger is going on here. And um, the one thing that some of the colleagues came up with, well, how about the neonicotinoids? Because as you remember, this is the criminalistic thinking now that I did show you in the beginning. Is this a skeleton or is it a mummy? It's a skeleton, even though everybody says it's a mummy. Just measure it. Um, here, the neonicotinoids that we, that we use today, and you will heavily have to rely on them because if you want to um, mass produce insects or mass produce plants for oil and for food and for you know, calories, um, then at the end of the day, you are going to have monocultures. And monocultures will only survive either you have very small monocultures in a natural environment, but that's only interesting probably for economically challenged countries, but in industrialized countries where you want to gain money, you would like to uh, earn money. Now you use, for example, neonicotinoids to protect your plants. Now, um, I looked it up and I was really surprised. I come out of a time where DDT was the most feared um, agricultural protection <laughs> substance, to put it on a, on a very broad, ter into a very broad term. And let's say the toxicity, toxicity of that is one. Just let's set it to one. The new neonicotinoids have a five to 10,000 10, fold higher toxicity. Now everybody, if you come from an agricultural environment, you say, well, no problem. We just apply it straight, you know, very close to the soil. And also it helps us to grow plants. So this will also um, help us to, produce less CO2 because we are more, more efficient, etc. But at the same time, what ha remember the, the first pictures. What happens to the web of life where you have thousands and millions of interactions between wasps and flies and beetles and plants and water and air and rainworms, uh, earthworms, etc. What happens to that? Well, that is severely affected by that. So no matter how economically you apply the neonicotinoid, the problem in the soil and for the neighboring nature reserve measured with actual data will remain. And that is, uh, that is a problem. Um, you, you still don't care? Okay, let's look at nature. This is the highest ranking journal for scientists. If you publish there, then you, you did it then your job is safe for the rest of your life. So this is a paper uh, from uh, autumn 2019. And what you see over time is that 
the, uh, all arthropods, because many people say, well, 75%, I don't believe that, and then I make calculations or their own measurements, and they don't find it. Okay, let's have a worldwide view published in Nature, the most severe referee, scientific referee system on planet Earth. It won't get any more severe and, and mean, if you, if you would like to put it like that. And the biomass of arthropods is straightly going down. Um, the abundance of insects, so the, the types of insects, is going straight down to hell, to hell, to, to, uh, to very, very low values here. And um, the, uh, the number of species too, so it's, it's the species number, the biomass, everything is going down, linearly, bam, down. And I mean, what is there to discuss? I really don't get it. All data collected by all scientists on planet Earth published in the best scientific journals point to only one solution, immediate CO2 reduction, no use of animals anymore apart from the ones that you probably use to feed people in economically changed countries, etc. That's a different story. And everything else, uh, for, don't use your swear word SUVs that I'm, that I'm uh, seeing there on the marketplace. And this is not a matter of uh, Wollsocken öko klimbim, you know, a matter of being a, a left-wing hippie, but this is a scientific matter published uniquely, unchallenged in all scientific journals that are, that in all articles, un completely unchallenged, that came out in the past two or three years. Um, but this also relates to something that has a per something personal. Let's say you're like, okay, come on, we got it. Oh, yeah, okay now. So how about your personal life quality? Probably one thing that you like is have a walk in the forest, have a walk in the park, and listen to birds, for example. Everybody likes birds, or most birds. Well, even those vertebrate species are dying out, and much, much faster than we thought. This is from the beginning of last year. Um, the the uh, disappearance of birds is 1,000-fold accelerated compared to you know whatever before <laughs> you can you can look up the you can look it up yourself for example here i mean red list is obviously problematic because it depends on which species people consider to be red list species but still even then if you look for example at the farmland specialists because we are we are talking about something that is farmland related the farmland birds are just going steeply down like the rainworms like the wasps like the flies like every single animal group that i did show you before again they are also pollinators, they also provide services, and also, like the birds, they are there for your personal enjoyment. Is this something measured, or am I making that up? This is severely measured. You can look it up in psychological and psychiatric journals. Even one hour of uh, embedding people into nature, into a nature context, severely raises their personal health status, immune status, and uh, just happiness status. This is scientifically measured. It's not, uh, it's not made up. Um, most, th just to show you uh, that this is known for a very long time, 10 years ago, the, this was in The Guardian and everywhere else, the pr out of, um, let's say, 600 primate species, 50% um, had to be put on the red list already, since we were talking about the red list. This is unimaginable. This is an un half of, the, of these animals are on the red list. Did you know that? I think probably no. Um, now, you lean back. You, you know, you're eating some food tonight, and you're like, okay, okay, okay. Let's calm down a little bit. It cannot be that bad. I do see animals around. You know, it just, it just can't be. This will be your, your reaction after my talk. Well, we do know the background rate of dying out of animals. This is the background rate of animals dying out from 1500 to 2000. No, that was, I think, in 2015 when the paper came out. The, yes. The, the references up here, you, in the YouTube video, you can see that, probably. Um, and the background extinction rate of animals is very low, and since industrialization started, they're just going steeply up. Again, this is measured, and um, it again shows you the same picture. So no matter from which angle you look, economically, most important for you, biologically, socially, culturally, happiness-related, no matter where you look, it's, it's going down the drain. And uh, to give you, bec because formerly I mentioned geological, geological standards, in many cases you hear that this is something that naturally happens. It's something that just happens, you know, the, the ice is melting, that's just because the, we have the end of some ice age or something like that. You all had the discussion at home with your weird uncle. 
and aren't. You, 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 and j just, just to give you an idea, this is also measured because paleontologists, who are probably not here in the room, but I know them from museums, and you can also go to the Museum of Natural History here in, in Magdeburg, or Magdeburg. You can, you can go to them and ask them about that. We are in the middle of the largest extinction event that ever occurred since human beings exist on planet Earth, measured with actual data. This is the sixth time since life on Earth exists, since we have such a mass extinction. extinction. So you can look back 500 million years. And what we are experiencing right now today, whilst you are listening and I'm standing here, is the sixth time since life on Earth exists that we have such an extinction event. Now, I would like to hear the reply of your weird uncle and aunt to that like, geological uh, fact. Um, and I'm, at the, I'm uh, more or less at the end of it. How much time? Wait, we started a little bit late. OK, maybe five more minutes. Um, just a little bit, a practical thing, and then I'm done. Now, since, bless you, since you are all highly educated, you have resources, you have money, even if you think you don't, but you, know, you have probably more than many other people. So you are, you are in a relatively good position in one of the richest countries of planet Earth. Now you would think, okay, it won't affect me that much. You know, New York City is flooded, okay, I don't know. And ah, wait a second, wasn't there a big flooding event in, in the Western Germany? Oh, wait a second, wasn't there a big flooding event a few years ago also in Eastern Germany? Ah, fuck. You know, you're, uh, you, when you think about it, you see, you, see, you see it coming. Now, but you could say, so, you know what, I don't care. I have a laboratory environment, and as long as I can, I will maintain the laboratory environment. I understand that the computer is only going to work when I have good computer lines. Okay, I will secure my computer lines. Um, I will take care of the flooding. I will take care of earthquakes. I will take care of heat. I will take care of everything. I will have a large amount of money, and money can always buy something. Because if people get poor, then money can buy something. Okay, inside of your laboratory, that's the last thing now. What do you do? when the rest of the world becomes very warm, and I experienced that since 2003, practically with our corpses and our insects. I gave you a glimpse of that already, or I mentioned it briefly. Um, one of the things that will influence your breeding of insects on plants will, is micro-influences that you usually don't think about. For example, micro-temperature changes. Maybe you have heard that when you are wearing polyester underwear, or um, if you're uh, riding a bike a lot, then your sperm quality decreases. And then you're like, Ugh, I don't know, maybe yes, maybe no. Well, this is proven, especially for polyester underpants. You, this, is a, this is a very uh, good way to not have children because the sperm quali quality is going down. Experimentally proven with actual data, actual scientific magazines. Now, OK, you're like, Ugh, yeah, whatever. Um, but what do you do when your animals are susceptible to very small temperature changes? or humidity changes, or light changes, or something that you just cannot control anymore. This is an example here. This is an animal that you can very easily breed. Many of you know it uh, probably. It's Tribolium, a uh, little beetle. And uh, what you see here is that the, that the sperm count is going down a lot once you have a m very small raise in temperature. Now, you can say, well, I have a climate, uh, you know, climatization in my laboratory. Well, I saw, I personally saw all over the world laboratories suffering from climate um, apparatuses <laughs> that did not work well. You all know it from Deutsche Bahn, Intercity Express. Um, but you would say, well, in my laboratory, it's not going to happen. It will happen because I saw it a lot. What very often happens is when you get a heat wave, and we will have heat wave after heat wave after heat wave after, after heat wave now and plus flooding. We, we will have parts of our buildings that we did not think of that they would heat up in a way that they are going to, uh, I'm sorry, to heat up the rest of the building. That's again something very practical and you know, sleeves rolled up and you're like, ah, come on. You know, he's just working with corpses and he doesn't have money and resources, but in our lab it's different. Well, I saw it so many times all over the world that laboratories did heat up Sometimes in, in small, uh, you know, there were small raises, but sometimes they were not so small. Sometimes up to 10 degrees Celsius, and it was just not accounted for and could not be changed techno technologically, because how do you change the climate control of your laboratory when you get heat wave after heat wave and the infrastructure is breaking down? Or if you don't have the money, or if you work in the laboratory and just cannot let the laboratory not work. So this is going to uh, come to you. 
And um, as The Guardian reported um, uh, three years ago, Hot House Earth, what I was talking about here, is just the beginning of the end because the main problem is going to be obviously an economical problem, but I think many of you are related to, to economical problems, so you probably can make up yourself what's going on. And when it comes to insect and plant breeding, this is from uh, the latest Blade Runner movie. Um, you can see that the prediction was that either everything is going to drown, that was in the old Blade Runner movie from the 1980s, and this is the, the second part, if you, if you want to call it like that, and they reverted it, and they just uh, you know, made a science fiction fantasy out of it that everything dries out. What nobody knew when the movie came out, that was very recently, was that both would happen. We have drying out and flooding at the same time. And don't forget the economical problem, because probably you just don't care. It, it is going to get you personally, your laboratory, your family, your house, everything out of economical reasons. And those economical reasons are the ones that make the world go round, as all of you know. So if you see the kids and um, they run around with their self-drawn uh, posters, Rettet unsere Welt, save our planet, schützt unsere Erde, protect our earth, um, make love, not CO2, don't ever smile again. There is absolutely nothing to smile or to smirk. We are scientifically proven in the worst case scenario, in the worst of all predicted scenarios. We have seen in the past weeks what is going on around the world. And it is not of any relevance what you personally believe, what you, what you can you know, do or what, what, what you can change, but it is for the first time, really for the first time, it is going to be a matter of the actual calculation only concerning the CO2, not talking about the, the earthworms and the moth, is now that we have approximately seven to eight years to revert everything economically, economically, that we knew before. Scientific prediction, not my personal prediction. So with this, um, I leave you and um, you can do with this whatever you want. I, my, my per, if I want, <laughs> if I'm supposed to make a prediction. My prediction is that nothing is going to happen and you will be just, okay, next talk, forget it. But I hope that in a few years you're going to click it on YouTube and then maybe you remember the talk in the former church in Magdeburg. Thank you very much.